Welcome to the Culture Lab. I'm your host, Aga Bayer. This podcast helps you turn your company culture into rocket fuel for meaningful growth. It explores how we can make the word work synonymous with fun, meaning, and belonging. It looks at how we can build remarkable cultures that scale as our businesses grow and the world keeps on changing. Think about something that bugs you about work, ideally, over which you have control. Don't go try to enroll a team in your new idea or your experiment or get sign off from your boss. Just think about something about your day. Maybe it's a meeting that you've gone to every week for two years where you've never said anything and where you don't think anyone would actually notice if you're there. And just like try not going to that meeting and see if something happens. Hello, and welcome to episode 83 of the Culture Lab podcast. This episode is brought to you by Culture Brain a one-of-a-kind global community for leaders and culture champions who want to learn new ways of cultivating remarkable cultures at scale in this brave new world of remote and hybrid work. The Culture Brain community is where we come together to answer some pretty darn hard, ungoogleable questions about culture. And our members get to participate in things like weekly huddles, masterclasses, flash mastermind groups, and talks from world-class experts on culture. And you know many of these experts from this podcast. But most importantly, we facilitate deep peer-to-peer connections because making work synonymous with fun, meaning, and belonging, it's definitely not a task for a single person. It requires tapping into the collective wisdom of bold, kind, and curious culture leaders who are on a mission to redefine and, frankly, decrapify work. So if this sounds like something you'd like to be a part of, check it out at tiny.one forward slash culture And don't worry, you don't have to write it down. There is a link in the show notes. All right. So first, a quick update. So we've been settling in in our new Athens home And I just want to thank all of you who sent me lovely emails and messages on LinkedIn after I shared the news of our relocation in the previous episode. I really, really appreciate your wishes and your kindness. And I want to wish all of you a safe, healthy, and creative 2022. Okay, so now it's time to introduce my guest today. So do you know, like, Sometimes you listen to a podcast and you feel like you'd like to be friends with the host. Well, this is how I've always felt about my guest today, Rodney Evans, who co-hosts the show called Brave New Work. Her co-host and business partner, Erin Dignan, has already been on our show. And I'm so, so excited to bring Rodney on the Culture Lab podcast today as well. So Rodney is a pioneer in adaptive organization design and the future of work. She has 20 years experience in all things transformation. She's researched, developed, and taught new ways of working in dozens of complex environments, such as Airbnb, Macy's, GE, Intuit, and Johnson & Johnson. Her mission is to slay bureaucracy, unleash talent, and modernize traditional workplaces and practices. And just like me, Rodney believes that the future of work is now, and the new approaches to old problems are key to our survival as a species. So without further ado, here is Rodney Evans, and we will be talking about new, better ways of managing a business and your people. Hi, I'm Rodney Evans, and uh, I am a totally obsessed dog mom, an avid reader of the Marseille Tarot, a co-host of a podcast called Brave New Work, a very proud Durham resident, and someone who has recovered from a traditional organization and a very expected climb up a corporate ladder and, uh, and kind of bailed on that a decade ago to discover the future of work. And in the last decade, I have been helping teams and organizations to realize ways of working that are more adaptive, more meaningful, and more human. And I'm really excited to be here and talk to you about that today. 
I am so excited to have you with us today, Rodney. Thank you for making the time to do this and welcome to the Culture Lab. Thank you so much. And by the way, I'm a completely obsessed dog mummy as well. So <laughs> already we have something in common. <laughs> it's so crazy how important those beings become in our lives, isn't it? I didn't know I could love them that much. I know. I know. It's, it's Same here. sort of bananas. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And I'm recovering from a corporate career as well. So yeah, we have lots of things in common. I'm also a big fan of your show, Brave New Work, that you host, co-host with Erin Dignan, who's your partner at The Ready. Yes. And I really love how you start each episode with this check-in round. So unpack that a little bit for us in terms of why you do it, and then we'll do our own check-in question. Fantastic. So uh, when Erin and I were conceiving of the show, we didn't know what we were doing. Maybe like a lot of podcast hosts, or I don't know, maybe other people are more buttoned up than we were. But we started thinking (laughs) about what a structure of a show could look like. And we use the check-in round mechanism in every meeting we do. And when we're working with clients, it's one of the first things we teach them. And it's often one of the last things to remain. So what's interesting to me is I will see, you know, companies five years later. And even if there are other practices that have evolved, they're still like hanging on exactly to the check-in round because it really works. And the reason that we do a check-in round is, as I say very often on our show, it's really about, first of all, getting present. So just giving us a second I don't know how your day has been. It's early here. I'm sort of rolling in from sleeping, a shower, coffee, a dog walk, et cetera. So it just gives us that moment of pause to get here and get clear. It helps us to learn a little bit more about each other. So building a little psych safety just in a short snippet. But the underlying thing that I think is the most interesting is about shared airtime. So check-in round for us is very much one of those start as you mean to finish kind of things. And what I mean by that is, in any gathering, we are looking for participation. If not exactly equal participation, ideally, everyone has space and airtime and feels compelled to contribute something. And so when we do something at a round to get going, we're starting from a position of a democratized meeting. And it does help us to continue that way. Yeah, I love that. And I learned that from your show and now I'm doing check-ins at every virtual session that I'm running with our clients or in our community. And it's so, so important, as you say, to to hear every voice in the room. Yeah. It's so incredibly important. Yeah. And as a facilitator, I I wonder if you found this. I know when I'm going into a, a new group that I haven't worked with before, even just this little thing that even in a big group can take less than five minutes. I find like I can really get a vibe of what is going on just oh, yeah. in the check-in round, which is so important because, you know, when you're going into to host or to facilitate a session with a group, it's like there's one person who's chatty and nice to you. And then there's a bunch of people just staring at you on the screen. And it's sort of hard to know sometimes what you're walking into. Yeah. So it's a good tool for facilitators, too. Yeah, absolutely. So let's do a check-in question here today. So basically, I have a question that I ask all our guests. So and we can treat this as our check in question. And the question is basically, what were the early cultural influences that shaped you as a person? It's such a cool question. So there are many. The thing that comes to mind first, that probably first and second close tie, I grew up playing classical music very seriously. So I started playing the cello when I was six years old. And I definitely was one of those kids that was in multiple orchestras. I was in a professional quartet by the time I was 13. I played in pit orchestras for operas and musicals. It was a very significant part of my identity. And that world, which you and many of your listeners probably know about, it's very traditional and it's very structured. It's very predicated on discipline. And it's very separate from the way that most kids grow up. So I think having two different identities and having an understanding of this sort of whole culture that is quite essential, but also quite antiquated, had a really significant impact on me, both in terms of learning to conform and learning discipline and not doing a lot of questioning of whether I was actually enjoying things, but also in terms of feeling like quite constrained and confined by that. And then ultimately leaving that because I didn't think that I could hang there as a professional. So I think that was very significant for me culturally. And then the other thing, I also grew up in a very 
particularly rarefied environment. I grew up in a smallish town in Connecticut outside of New York City, and there was not any diversity to speak of. There was a lot of wealth and money there. And it's sort of a mirror of the classical world thing. I had this awareness from a fairly early age that this was not normal and just sort of suspected that there was like a whole big world out there that I was quite curious about exploring. And and so in both of these instances, you know, I was like groomed in this very specific way, not even necessarily by my parents, though they were there, but by these very closed, specific cultures that ultimately felt kind of constraining. And so my life choices from college on were not necessarily a rebellion against that, but certainly there was a keen awareness that I was unwilling to stay in this very clear and specific path that had been available. Yeah, a scripted life. Oh, this is so fascinating because, again, I can see similarities between you and me here in so many aspects. But If we're doing a check-in question, which now we're doing, I'm going to share what were my early cultural influences as well. And, you know, I grew up in communist Poland behind the Iron Curtain. Mm. And that was a very confined space to live in as well. And there was definitely a scripted life for everyone. Mm -hmm. And I felt just like you that there is a bigger, more interesting, more fascinating world out there. And also there was this, so this was a macro culture. And then in my family, it felt like everyone was engaged in some form of escapism. So, you know, really Mm. trying to come up with their own way of creating an environment and the world that they would actually enjoy living in. Mm -hmm. So in my family, we had a lot of teachers and a lot of athletes. And so I think that that was a way for our family members to survive, either really go down the rabbit hole and explore a topic that was super interesting to them or just give themselves to sports and achievement, you know, in that field. And I think I absorbed that and I quickly learned that I'm responsible for creating my own microcosm and making it interesting and engaging for myself. And it's kind of stuck with me. So, you know, I look at my life today and I'm like, I'm doing this all the time. And I think this is what makes me so fascinated by culture and how you can shape culture and microcultures and stuff like that. That is fascinating. Yeah. It's it's just incredible how our experiences from early childhood sort of follow us. (laughs) They sure do. Throughout life, right? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Scary, really. (laughs) You really can't get rid of it. I know. It's so true. Anyway, yeah, it's funny. So I'd love us to start our conversation today around, you know, this thing that dominates the discourse around work these days. And it's this conversation around the kind of shifts that need to happen for companies to be successful in this brave new world of hybrid and remote work. And there seems to be consensus around one thing, I guess. I don't know if you have the same impression, but I feel like we all agree that we can no longer rely on this old model where, you know, how much time, for example, you spend in the office is a measure of your commitment or even of your effectiveness. So in your view, Rodney, I know that you do a lot of work with a lot of organizations If that's true, and if you agree with that, what is the best alternative to this old top-down presence-driven approach? I'm so glad to see that that is where the discourse is and where it's headed. And I've joked a lot in the last year that with every passing day, I feel slightly less like gaslit by the world Mm. and and just (laughs) less like a space alien, you know, less like the person who sort of knows certain things to be true, but, but still find myself in a world that doesn't believe them. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, I do think that that's where we are. And I think hybrid work has just been an interesting lever to see things that have always been there. So there are many answers to your question. And the two to three top line answers that I would give are, one, we have to stop focusing on the what of work and start focusing on the how. And it's such a significant shift, not just in terms of mindset, but in terms of resourcing and talent and orientation and how we spend our time. 
to believe that things like how we steer our strategy or how we do our budgets or how we hire people is more important than who we hire or what we spend or the strategic words on a piece of paper. To me, for this new world to unfold, if that's not a fundamental shift in belief, we're going to struggle for Mm -hmm. sure. So that's one. The second is really about participation. So people who, who listen to a lot of your guests and a lot of our guests and read the things that we all read understand that we have this deep belief that for companies or teams or schools or religions or families to be successful, it requires continuous participation and continuous evolution. And the idea that we can live the way that we lived in an industrial age where we make a plan, someone makes a plan, not we, someone makes a plan, someone who holds a lot of power makes a plan, and then a bunch of people execute that over a long time horizon, and the job is to just make sure it comes true, is just a fallacy that has destroyed our economy, basically. And the antidote to that is understanding that in a complex world, in a complex market, working in complex systems, what is required is a continual sensing and responding, continual experimentation, continual adaptation. We can't change management our way to the future we must collectively steer. And all of that adds up to like self-management. I mean, self-management is the headline over everything that I believe is important and is coming and I'm excited about. And that's, you know, whether you're looking at companies that have been practicing sociocracy for a long time or the hires of the world or the Dow movement that is emerging, there is a drumbeat around not having a pyramid or an inverted pyramid, getting rid of the pyramid altogether and looking to models more like networks, more like nature to understand complexity. Yeah, love it. I know that The Ready is one of these companies that is actually walking the talk. The most interesting thing for us to explore right now is really how are you organized and how do you put this to practice in your company? And maybe then we can sort of branch out and talk about your learnings from your work with your client organizations as well? Sure, I'd be happy to. The Ready is a really good example, I think, of what is possible. Full disclaimers, we have made many mistakes in our journey. Mm. (laughs) This has not been like a linear, you know, all the experiments weren't successful, just to be clear. We want to learn from your mistakes so that we don't have to make them, right? So that's fantastic. Absolutely, absolutely. So in terms of our current structure, you're catching us at an interesting moment because we are now at the size where we are creating a circle structure with sub-circles. And we, we tried this once before, and we moved back to a larger group because we weren't quite ready yet, and we didn't have the degree of specialization and sort of the there there to make sub-circles really sing. And now we do. And the way that that has happened, and maybe this will be a good example for listeners who aren't as familiar with self-management or self-organizing teams or companies, it has been quite organic in nature. So I'll give one example, but this has sort of been rinse and repeat at the ready. Maybe two years ago, probably two years ago, at a retreat, one of the initiatives identified was around hiring and rethinking our hiring practice. Mm -hmm. I raised my hand to steward that initiative. And what that initiative started with was a very design-oriented like principles, anti-principles, trade-offs, outcomes, et cetera. The first trimester of that, we found a platform. We had some thoughts. This has evolved every trimester. And probably about 18 months ago, it became clear that hiring is no longer initiative. Hiring is a team of people who do a thing forever, and they should be a circle. And so hiring was the first group that governed a circle that has its own spending authority, its own domain, its own clarified roles that are separate from what the core business does. So that has happened in hiring, that has happened with growth, that has happened with a board circle and a source circle, that's happened with a transformation circle, which is effectively where all the people who do the client work come together to learn from one another. There is another circle that will be with us probably in the new year. 
that will be more focused on content assets, et cetera. So that's where we are right now. And the next play that is obvious is that each circle is really running its own PL in the marketplace. So for example, project teams would pay hiring out of their own margin to source candidates for them, mm-hmm. et cetera. So we're in this it's not even a liminal space. We're just in this place of market maturity in terms of our own internal market where we are starting to see specialization and structure. But to date, the financial picture still looks the same as it did when we were one big blob. And that will evolve over time in ways that I can imagine and probably many that I can't imagine yet. So basically, to double click on that a little bit and help our listeners understand how circles work. So Are you in the hiring circle right now? I'm not anymore. Yourself? You're not anymore. But it's possible for someone to be in the hiring circle and at the same time be in three, four, maybe even five other circles. Is that the concept that basically... Theoretically. Yeah, theoretically. And what happens practically at the ready? I mean, practically, because almost everyone at the ready is what we call a transformer, which means they are doing transformation work for clients in the world. Practically, it would be quite difficult given the demand that we have at present from clients to be holding, for example, a role in every circle or a role in five circles. Yeah. But that being said, most people hold a role besides their transformation work. So most people have, say, they're dedicated to a transformation project and also stewarding the training circle, which is responsible for training new transformers. And so we look at that just as it's your role portfolio and it's your role mix. And there are roles that are governed roles at the ready that take an hour a week. And there are roles at the ready, internal roles that take 15 hours a week. Now, I couldn't do a 15 hour a week role and be on a dedicated client project. There's just no universe where that could happen. But maybe I could be on a a half project. So the idea here is just that people are are intentional. And again, this is where we get at the how, because these things do take more time and thought than just being like, Rodney, here's your job description. Mm -hmm. You're the COO now. Go get it. But it's really worth it because you have an idea of what the work is that you're holding and energizing. And if you are holding a role as I was in hiring, it's a good example, I was holding a role in hiring that I would say I was no longer really energizing because I had too many roles in my stack. Mm -hmm. And I had just like lost my excitement about it a little bit. And so when there was a person who was excited to do that, I was thrilled to hand that over. Mm -hmm. So talk to me a little bit about what it means to be energizing a role. So I understand a piece is you are being energized by this work and excited by doing the work. Are there any other aspects of energizing a role? That's really holacracy language that we borrow. But the way that I think about it is in self-management, because there's not a hierarchy, because there's certainly power at the ready and reputational power and, you know, lots of kinds of power that we could talk about. But I don't have the authority to say to Sharon in her role now as hiring steward, like, you must X. That just it does not exist where we are. Mm-hmm. And so I think what it looks like to be energizing a role is to be self-managing in that role. And so if I'm stewarding the growth circle, not only do I want that to be giving me energy, but I need to have the energy to be looking at that circle and saying, okay, what are our 90-day outcomes? What is missing in terms of our operating rhythm? What should we be doing resourcing-wise? Should we be doing a market analysis? Should we be doing customer interviews? Should we be doing case studies? There's no one telling me to do that work. And, And unlike when we're in client work where we have built in accountability because we have partners who want to achieve things and we are helping them to get there, when we're energizing a role for the ready in a subcircle, there's a lot of self-direction because there isn't, you, you can gather data from the rest of the market to say, you know, what would most serve you from growth circle? But ultimately, it's my responsibility to have the vision and the clarity to energize that role without other people holding me to it. Yeah, totally. I think this is exactly one of the reasons that a lot of internal projects in traditional organizations don't get done because 
people go on those retreats, just like the one that right. you, you've shared. You went on, right? And there is this long list of wonderful things that people feel really excited about doing. But then life happens, basically, and you go back to your office reality or your work reality, and suddenly you realize, well, all these wonderful things, especially when it comes to internal work, like yes. how do we develop our people or whatever, they just fall through the cracks. And so I think what you're saying is that in your approach, you look at it in a way more responsible and intentional way. And there is a lot of introspection, almost I'm hearing, where people need to ask themselves, do I have the energy to do this? And am I bringing enough to this role to be in the circle? And if not, then what's the next step? Like, do I need to withdraw? Do we need to bring in someone else? Absolutely. Yeah, you you totally nailed it. One of the big things that we have learned and continue to learn, we don't have this totally sorted yet, but compensation is a big part of that. And no one at the ready and probably no one that has ever come on this show believes in carrots and sticks as being the way to motivate people. But money is energy and it's a signal. And because of the kind of company that I work at, because of what we do and who we are and the kind of people we attract, there's no one at the ready who is going to take money from the middle for an internal job that they are not performing. That is just, it would be so antithetical to our ethos. And that's just like, that's not the vibe. That being said, you can go too far the other direction. And where people have really underpaid themselves or not paid themselves at all, or say, you know, I'm just going to do this like for the love of the game. A lot of times those things don't get done. And so sometimes saying, you know, I'm going to pay myself, I don't know, $3,000 a month to do this role on top of whatever other things I'm doing, that accountability mechanism is really important because it's transparent to the system. You're getting consent on some level from the system that might be in your subcircle. But a lot of times the conversation that unfolds around money is, do you really have the time to dedicate mm -hmm. that this money would indicate? because don't get yourself into the situation where you're paying yourself and then you just feel really bad because you don't actually have right. the time for it. Right. I think in a very healthy self-managing systems, those are great conversations to have. It's a great conversation for someone to be able to say, I would love to dedicate 15 hours a week to growth and pay myself X. And also, you all know what I have on. Does that seem realistic to you or are my eyes bigger than my bandwidth right now? Hmm. I love that. I love that. And so I think that our listeners might be getting their minds blown right now uh, listening <laughs> to you <laughs> about how people can take on tasks and then pay themselves for doing these tasks. Right. So I think you absolutely need to speak a little bit more about that. How does that work? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> if that was mind blowing, wait for what's next. <laughs> so two things. One is we do self-set pay at the ready. I actually just brought a new policy to govern around our self-set pay process to give it a little bit more structure and a little more clarity around how to get advice. But effectively, if I am joining the ready and I am going to be doing client work, I set my own default rate by month for what I wish to be paid on that project. And the way I do that is by answering a couple of simple questions about my experience and how I see myself related to the market. These are not long essays. These are a couple hundred words. And then I get advice. I get advice from three other members about my compensation proposal. I can integrate their advice. I can ignore their advice. And then I put the amount of money that I want to make per month into a Notion page. And that's that. Now. No approvals. No. There's no approval. Green well, lights. Wow. No green lights. There's just advice. That being said, this is where having a marketplace of work comes into play because mm -hmm. say I'm a project steward and you're new to our system and you've set yourself an incredibly high rate. If I'm going to put a project team to so let's say I've sold something and now I need other people to work on it and I go and I look at the member list and I look at default rates and I look at who has availability and I see, oh, Aga says here she wants to come on to a to a dedicated transformation project. Okay, great. And I look at your rate and I'm like, wow, if I pay her that, that means that 
either I have to pay myself less or I have to pair her with someone who charges less because we can't have three people who make a ton of money on one small project Mm -hmm. for obvious Mm -hmm. reasons. We've all done service businesses. And so maybe I don't ask you onto that project, even though you'd like to be on it. So there often is a little bit of market correction. And candidly, it goes the other direction as well. I very recently had a colleague who wanted me to do something that I didn't want to do particularly. And he was like, I will make this worth your while. Like, Uh (laughs) name your number. And I was like, it's going to be a big number. And he was like, I don't care. I I have the money. I want you you to do this. And I did. Yeah, I did. And it was great. You know, I think that's how a healthy marketplace works. Yeah, yeah. This is absolutely amazing. And I think a portion of our listeners who have experience in professional services firms, for example, they will be familiar with that notion of people having certain fees and how you will pick your team based on how much people charge. But I think for the vast majority of our listeners, this is a completely new concept. And I don't even know what question to ask you right now, because if people find this a fascinating idea and maybe something that they would like to experiment with in their organization. I guess the first question would be, where do you start? How do you even know if this could work at your company? And what is the right starting point? Maybe it's not even rewards, right? Probably not. Right. But if you really want to have an organization where people are driven by the outcomes that they want to deliver. Mm-hmm and a high-performing organization, and you are open to this idea of having a self-managed organization, what do you need to think about first? Sure. It's a good question. It's a tricky question because my answer is different if you are inside a very fixed and calcified bureaucracy and you want to move this way. But let's start there. Do you know what? I, I'll yeah. give you an example because sure. I actually, we have a member in our community who's exactly at this stage, I feel, and they are a small organization, relatively small organization, 250 people on a relatively high growth trajectory. And there is a conversation happening right now in the organization. How can we move our organization more towards, not more, towards self-management? They are not self-managed right now. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about this size and let's talk about this scenario where there is appetite to discuss this, but it's a pretty traditionally structured organization right now and they don't know where to start. Yeah, great. So 250 is a great size to be making that kind of move. It's a lot harder when you're working with 80,000 person companies, mm-hmm. which I have. I'm glad that you brought up a really specific example because I think this could be illustrative of the complexity of this and how the approach would differ from a traditional restructuring or change management or programmatic or framework approach. So what I would do is, first of all, don't start with 250 people. It will not work. (laughs) Find a group or a team or a place that is ripe for this. I cannot tell you how many times I've gone into a company that is smaller than 500 people And we've started to do some OS work. And when I say OS, I mean operating system. And at the ready, we use an operating system canvas as just as a systems thinking tool to consider what you're designing for, what your practices are in fields like meetings, information, innovation, authority, structure, et cetera. So when I say OS... Yeah. And if our listeners want to learn more, you can definitely get the book that Aran Dignan has written, Brave New Work to learn more details and we're going to share a link in the show notes for you. Awesome. So when I say OS, all I mean is that the underlying sort of system. Mm -hmm. So when I go into companies and say I get a leadership team together, it's, it's really helpful to start with a leadership team. I really resisted this for a long time, which probably has something to do with our check in round question where Mm -hmm. I was just like, it should be viral. It should be insurgent. Mm -hmm. Like screw the leaders. But Uh, They can just block (laughs) stuff really fast, you know, like (laughs) when they don't like things, they just make it super Uh tricky, super tricky for the rest of us. So (laughs) sometimes, you know, I don't know that the, the best work is always done starting with the leadership team, but having the leadership team involved in the work of identifying where we could begin is generally useful because generally they don't screw it up later if you include them in that. 
And so what I often find when I get a leadership team together to start unpacking the OS, what the tensions are in the OS, where things have worked in a really great way, there is almost always an example from some point or period in the history of some group effectively working as a self-managed team or organization. And it's usually like we had to launch a thing. There was a crisis. There was a sale. Yeah. You know, I worked for an investment bank for a long time. And there was this one period of time every year where we had to work cross-functionally to get to do the annual compensation work, which was an absolute beast. And truly, the rest of the yeah. year, we would have like pushed each other out of the way for a promotion. And that three mm-hmm. months of the year, we talked every single day and acted like this, like, you know, team playing cooperative to get this thing done. So I just use that as an example because there almost always is some group that has kind of done it before. And often it's helpful to start there, start where there's readiness, don't start where it's like very, very screwed up. So we go from the leadership team. We get a group of people who wants to start making moves towards self-management. And then what do we do? This is the part that I think about as the basement. Because everybody in those first conversations and those first workshops wants to pick out wallpaper. And I'm like, bro, you have no basement. We (laughs) We don't even have a house yet. Settle down. And what I mean by these foundational basement practices is like, what are our agreements around tooling? What are our agreements around meetings? Do we have a clarified team charter? Do we have clarified decision rights or authority? Do we understand what our roles are? Not the job description you saw on you know, LinkedIn seven years ago, but a portfolio of roles. These are the foundational pieces, the foundational agreements that we need to make explicit and get practicing before we can really do much more than that. Because Mm -hmm. until we have an understanding, for example, doing role work in a traditional organization is generally quite illuminating because how often are we super clear on what the boss, quote unquote, does? And when we start to unpack power, like power holding roles into their function, into the jobs to be done, into the way they contribute back, et cetera, we often a very different picture emerges. And often what we see is, There are more useful, higher value things that the boss, manager, power holder could be doing if they're willing. And so this is how we start making these moves towards self-management. We have an operating rhythm of meetings that are participatory. We have tooling that's transparent where we're not siloing information in emails. We have a team charter so we know why we are even a group of humans who interacts with each other. We have some level of authority so we're not permission seeking for the dumbest thing all day, every day of our lives. We Mm -hmm. have a portfolio of roles that we can look at and say, who can really decide what? Who is really on the hook for what? And do those things go together? Do I have the authority to do what you, my team member, expect me to do? And if we want to have some sort of leaderly role, which is totally fine in self-management, that's not antithetical, (laughs) what is that? And like, what is it that the group is consenting to in terms of a management or leader-like structure? Yeah. This is interesting. So speaking of leaderly roles, what are your what are your roles in your company? Like, do you have people who have these leaderly roles? And if yes, what do they boil down to? Yeah. So we do. And to me, What they mostly boil down to is what is needed. So, for example, Aaron and I both hold a role that is called source. And source. Yeah. And and that sort of evolved over time. It didn't start that way at all. But what source is, is fundamentally responsible for that people who are out in the world doing transformation work with our amazing clients are not is like choosing a payroll provider making sure equity awards get distributed, planning retreats, holding an operating rhythm. It's like somebody, you know, in the in the tragedy of the commons, like somebody has to look after the commons. And so that role does have power because all of those things come with decision-making authority, spending authority, et cetera. But it's not absolute power. Mm-hmm. Someone else, for example, who is a transformer, just proposed and passed a new 401k plan. 
like that wasn't me or Aaron's idea. It's not like all of those things have to flow through us, but that is a consented to role that is multi-filled by he and I that is basically responsible for the ready fulfilling its purpose in many forms that that takes. Yeah, I love that. And do you seek advice in the source role on some of the decisions from your team members? Yes. So, you know, it's interesting. Yes and no. I would say sometimes, I think I think Aaron and I probably ask different people for a different advice around different things. Because we have a participatory governance process and we govern new agreements at source, one of the like varsity moves when you have participatory governance, and we can talk more about what that means if you think your listeners might not be super familiar, is to not do tons of pre- workshopping, but to just create a proposal, bring it to the group and integrate feedback live or in a tool. And so I'm saying that because a lot of times, like with the default rate setting proposal that I just passed, for example, actually, I don't know if it's passed yet. It might still be making its way through Murmur, but (laughs) I didn't seek any advice. And it was a good, but not amazing proposal. And I had a lot of questions about what else should go in there, and what I might have missed. And so I just put it into the machine and let the other members of Sort of Circle start picking it apart. And I just sort of trusted that I would get the questions and reactions that I needed to make it really good. Yeah. Honestly, I think that happens probably more frequently than people getting tons of advice before they propose. I think in in systems where there is pretty high trust and a lot of participation, I think for the most part, people kind of just like make a proposal and see what happens. And sometimes it goes great and sometimes it does not. Yeah. And that's that's how that game gets played. Again, sort of getting into the shoes of our listeners who who want to try it out. And it sounds like such an interesting and effective way of doing things, creating a proposal, and then, as you say, encouraging others to sort of poke holes and and challenge you and highlight the strengths and also the weaknesses of your proposal and so on and so forth. And I think that it does require a foundation of psychological safety and trust and so on. And so is this one of the biggest barriers that your clients bump into when they try to run their first pilot when it's not in place? Like, what are the things that are really difficult to get over when, you know, you have been functioning in a completely different setup for sometimes decades? Yeah, it's such a good question. The big thing that really becomes a headwind is that clients are applying their old way of thinking to a brand new practice. Mm. And so in something like a participatory governance structure, we're trying to get to consent. They're used to consensus. So there's a discomfort with the idea that something is good enough versus everybody likes it. They're used to stakeholdering rather than participation in the moment. So that's a shift. They're used to integrating all of the advice. I mean, any of us who's come from a traditional organization has felt the pain of V72 of the PowerPoint deck, where I sort of joke that like the 30th person who just needs to pee on it a little bit is like, (laughs) I would really prefer Helvetica. And you're just like, oh my God, this isn't leaving the building. Um, But in a healthy governance process and a healthy integrative decision-making process, it's not my job as a proposer to integrate every single piece of feedback, particularly because there's going to be feedback that is in diametric opposition. Right. It's my job as a proposer to make sense of that and to pick one or ignore them both and be like, you know what, actually, I'm pretty happy with my proposal and I'm going to see if I can get consent to it as it is. But that's another shift. Like that makes people very uncomfortable. Yeah. So I think that for people who are trying this for the first time, do it on something small. Mm-hmm. There's tons of resources around that out there around integrative decision making, you know, looking at Ted Rao's work and all of the sociocracy material, like those folks are incredibly generous in putting stuff out. We did a podcast episode or two on just this topic. But 
don't make the mistake of like a big swing. Like the, your first participatory decision making process shouldn't be like, should we sell our company or like, should we go public? <laughs> it should be like, should we go to lunch today? together Mm -hmm. like try to understand that this is a practice it is not something that is going to fix everything and that the best way to practice is in you can create safety by making the decision really pretty safe to fail and start there start with the reps on things that are totally within your control you know small and fairly inconsequential just get the practice, just build the muscle, just get the reps before you try to do something that has like really significant impact to your team. Mm -hmm. I know that it's very hard to answer this question because there are so many moving parts, but I know also that our listeners will want you to take a stab at the question anyway. How long, people ask, does it take to make a full transformation? So again, going back to that case study of a company that is 250 people with a lot of appetite to move towards self-management, if they really do the work, how long would it typically take to make a full transformation? People love to ask this question. I know. You know what? I'm not even going to say it depends because they already know it depends. Yeah. (laughs) For a group like that, I would say 18 months. Mm -hmm. And Without getting into all of the caveats, the reality is you're never done. I mean, Mm -hmm. if you were looking at the Ready's quote unquote transformation journey, we're in year six and it will never end. So it's like, when are we done? I don't know. When we stop having a company, I guess. Yeah. And that's going to be true for everyone. To me, here's how I would think about the architecture of that project. Maybe that will make it a little bit easier. There's the initial group that is highly ready that we are going to work with. That's a team or a team of teams. And we're going to get them. We're going to get that basement, you know, installed. So they're going to have this foundational ways working. And in three months, that team or team of teams is going to be on their way. They're going to have a basement and they're going to start putting up some walls for their house. Mm -hmm. And in six months, that group is going to be, they're going to have the sort of starter pack of practices around self-management pretty dialed in. Like they're going to know their roles. They're going to be playing from roles. They're going to be doing participatory governance. They're going to be steering strategy quarterly. They're going to be doing stuff, but they won't probably have moved on to tackle other things that are more cross-functional, more gnarly, more outside of their locus of control. And they'll still be in enough of a nascent state that if a new leader came in and was like, no, thank you. It wouldn't be that hard to rip out. Mm -hmm. We'll call that now we're at sort of the nine to 12, nine-ish months. What I'm looking for in the the back half of that is total self-sufficiency and an ability to apply the mindsets that we've cultivated through the basement practices to everything. So what I know a client is sort of done or quote unquote done with me is when they can look at any new tension in their operating system and go, what are the principles we're designing for? What are the trade-offs we're going to make? What are their 90-day outcomes? What is the group of roles that needs to swarm this particular experiment to make it work? What are our agreements around? Like when they can do that for budgeting or buying a company or going to space, I'm like, okay, you guys are good. You're <laughs> you're good enough without me. Yeah. Because now what you're showing me is you have a tool set and it doesn't matter anymore what you're building. Right. Awesome. That's awesome. One last thing I want to ask, unfortunately, we're running out of time before we move to our rapid fire questions is there's been this um, notion of outcomes-based culture going around, which I think is basically this idea that this close to self-management, but it's not entirely that, where you, you give emphasis to what outcomes you expect people to have rather than telling them how to do their work. Mm-hmm. And it seems to me like it's this mid-path, you know, if you don't want to go towards self-management entirely. Are you familiar with that? And then I what am. is your... Okay. So talk to us a little bit about that. (laughs) (laughs) We could do a whole other episode on this. So (laughs) I am a fan of outcomes generally. The way that we do strategy work at the ready is to have an essential intent 
that we can talk about that we intend for it to serve us for about 18 months, though we do intend to steer that along the way. So when we create our essential intent, it is with a 18 month view, understanding it might change. And then the the one layer below that is not an annual plan. It is quarterly or trimesterly outcomes. Maybe I could just clarify for your listeners, like to me, what the difference is between an objective or goal and an outcome. Because yeah. this is where I think people get it wrong. And they say they want to do outcomes-based work, but then what they do looks a lot more like goal or objective setting. Mm -hmm. So objectives or goals specify the work that we aim to deliver. I will make X, I will hire Y, I will sell Z. They're basically fixed. So for most of us, when we set annual goals at our crappy old jobs, We generally didn't look at them again. Our job was just to check the box on them at the end of the year. So we assume that conditions won't change and that our goals won't change. They often define the how of the thing. So I find a lot of times in objectives or goals or OKRs, there's like a in order to X, we will Y. Mm -hmm. So in order to increase engagement, we will buy pizza. Mm -hmm. So, and to me, I'm like, don't tell people how to increase engagement. Like, you know, (laughs) put a line in the sand about what you're getting from engagement. And basically an objective, we're just trying to measure whether the plan is coming true. We're not particularly concerned about the impact that it had. And that's what good outcomes work does. Good outcomes work is about the impact we intend to make. So I don't ever want to see again anywhere increase employee engagement. What does that mean? What are you trying to get? Like, do the work of really wrestling with the group that cares about what the impact of employee engagement is. Because mm-hmm. most mm-hmm. people don't. They're just like, could we get it from a 40 to a 60? And it's like, well, what is that? What does that get you? And can you translate that for us? Like in your experience, when companies set that outcome or that goal of increasing employee engagement, what is usually the impact they want to get through it or what emerges to be more important to focus on than that? Usually they don't know. And usually there are more interesting things under there. So often what we find is employees don't have what they need to do their jobs properly, like what they need in terms of authority or technology or resourcing. And so that is something that is often under there. Sometimes there's a lack of clarity around what a team is up to or the way in which it's going to contribute or how it's going to work. A lot of times there are missing agreements. So there's missing clarity in terms of how we do certain things, what workflows we use, how we make decisions, et cetera. So I think we can we can often unpack that and get there. But I think the sort of meta point, I'm literally, this is emerging for me right this second, is like when we say we want to increase employee engagement, it becomes this circular thing where we don't really know what that means. We don't really do the work of knowing what it means, but the metric also becomes the objective. It's like the way we measure this is also now the new thing we want. And I'm like, that's dumb. What are we getting from that? Like that's, you know. It's like this example I've spoken to Charlie Saul not so recently, uh, where he talked about, you know, the typical surveys and engagement survey actually mm-hmm. is one of those where he's like, if we we're sitting in this room together, I could ask you on a scale from one to five or to 10 or whatever, how do you like the wallpaper in this room? And you could say it's a one. And then I could go ahead and, you know, <laughs> create this whole renovation project so that you are more engaged. But actually, this, you know, the wallpaper is not doing anything for you, right? Like right. it's not something that helps right. you be productive or effective at work. And so sometimes th- this is what happens. So some arbitrary questions or areas that we look at seem to need work when actually, as you say, when you look at the impact of the wallpaper on people's work, you realize, oh, it doesn't change much. So maybe we shouldn't be focusing on that. That's such a good example. And that's exactly right. And in that example, just like take it one step further, the dynamic that reinforces the bureaucracy that happens is we do the survey and then it comes up and there's a whole bunch of massaging of the data so that nobody's embarrassed. And then in Mm -hmm. dark corners, we all see (laughs) how much the people who work for us actually hate us. And that's super fun. And (laughs) then this dynamic of, okay, we got the data from them. 
Now we, as the leaders, will figure out Mm -hmm. what the wallpaper should be. And it's like, we're already in the wrong dynamic. Like the point is that we are in a transparent, evolutionary environment where as a team, it's not me reading what Aga said about me as a manager and being like, what could I do to make her happy? It is as a team having a way to express needs and have the authority to get your needs met and to steer continuously. And then we don't really need a survey. Yeah. And authority is a big thing here. Yeah. So it is. So mm-hmm. just to talk briefly about outcomes, I, I think the the difference between what we just said about objectives and outcomes is it's really articulating the impact we want to make. It's assuming that there will be experimentation to get there. It's doing work around the why. I know I've talked a lot about how and ways of working. But what I find is that, you know, when I worked at a bank and I had to set my annual objectives, I never thought about really why I was picking those or what we were getting for them or what would be different or true if I achieved them. So it's doing that wrestling. And then if there's measurement to be made, it's generally not one number. It's a way of knowing that there has been the intended impact. Yeah. And all of that just takes a lot more work and a lot more thinking. But like that might be the best work you do in that quarter is as a team or a leadership team to wrestle with the impact, like the dent that you are trying to make and break that into no more than five, but ideally three outcomes for the quarter rather than being like, here's an objective. Here's seven key results that have nothing to do with each other. Everybody go. Yeah, 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 exactly. I, it, this is such a good conversation to have at this time of the year, because when, right. when this episode is going to be out in the world, it's going to be the beginning of the year. And I think for a lot of companies, this is when they sort of revisit their plans for the year and so on. So it's a really great thing to think about. What are the, the three most important outcomes for you for the first quarter of 2022? And really focusing on the things that are going to get you these outcomes and and deciding what not to do as well, because it's not so important. I wish we had more time to talk about this, but I know that we don't. So two more minutes. We have this section in, in the show that is called rapid fire questions. And I ask you five questions and your challenge is to answer all the five questions in under two minutes. Are you up for it? Let's okay, do it. Let's go. So. Number one, how do you define organizational culture? Culture is an emergent property of the choices that you make in your operating system. What are the signs that a company culture needs some work or perhaps even a major overhaul? Blaming the people without looking at the system. Dotted lines in an org chart. (laughs) Vagueness in language or lack of specificity or making things explicit. And meetings that are dominated by one or a couple of voices. What company do you admire for the culture and why? Ugh, everyone's going to hate me, but they're ready. <laughs> and, and the reason is because I don't believe in assessing cultures that I've not been a part of because I just think it's impossible to do so and it's not complexity conscious. So yeah. I'll take the ready for 800, Alex. Okay, awesome. What books on culture, on leadership, philosophy, art, I don't know, any books that would help our listeners to think deeper, better, about cultivating an awesome working environment? Anything by Greg McEwen, Effortless and Essentialism are both amazing. (laughs) A book I go back to probably once a year is Get Out of Your Mind and Into Your Life by Dr. Steve Hayes. It's about cultivating psychological flexibility. And of course, Brave New Work by my buddy Aaron. Yeah. So what is one thing that our listeners can do tomorrow to build their own culture lab and start cultivating a culture that will help them and their teams to bring their vision to life? Think about something that bugs you about work, ideally, over which you have control. Don't go try to enroll a team in your new idea or your experiment or get sign off from your boss. Just think about something about your day. Maybe it's a meeting that you've gone to every week for two years where you've never said anything and where you don't think anyone would actually notice if you're there. And just like try not going to that meeting and see if something happens. Just think about something you have control over and run an experiment. Reflect on that experiment very briefly to see how it's going for you and see what that gets you. This is music to my ears, being the host of a podcast that's called Culture Lab. I just experiment. I love it. Just experiment. Yeah. 
So in closing, Rodney, if our listeners want to learn more about you, about your work, about the Ready, what would be the best places to visit online? Sure. So uh, we are at theready.com. You can find uh, the Brave New Work podcast anywhere you get your podcasts. And I am on Twitter and LinkedIn and would be delighted to connect with any of you. Amazing. Thank you so much for being here. It was such a great conversation. I'm sure that people have learned a lot. And I just want to say I appreciate you. I appreciate the Ready, the work that you do. Thank you. I'm Aga Bayer, the creator and host of the Culture Lab podcast. And this is the Culture Lab team. Production manager, Lindsay Nunez. Sound producer, Heather McPherson, Twisted Spur Media. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Culture Lab podcast. Rodney and I hope that it will inspire you to think broader and deeper about how you manage your business, but also your people. And if you'd like an opportunity to interact with Rodney and other guests of the Culture Lab podcast in live sessions where you can learn more on the topic and discuss things with them directly, this is just one of many benefits you'd enjoy if you were a member of the Culture Brain community. Culture Brain is one of a kind global community for culture leaders who look for new ways of cultivating remarkable cultures in this brave new world of remote and hybrid work. If you are in charge of a culture shaping project, and if you believe that work should be synonymous with fun, with meaning and belonging, you'd probably feel right at home in our community. It's a really diverse group of culture leaders from Fortune 100 to tiny startups on a rapid growth trajectory. And what brings us together is a passion for cultivating a healthy culture at scale. We are guided by our values of being bold, being kind, and being curious. And we'd love for you to join if it feels like the right fit for you. You can learn more at tiny.one forward slash culture brains. And you can find the link in the show notes. And now a quick preview of the upcoming episode. My next guest is the author of one of the best books I read in 2021. In fact, his book was one of my top three books for culture brain leaders. Dave and Bavel is the new Adam Grant. He's an associate professor of psychology and neural science at New York University. And from neurons to social networks, Jay's research investigates the psychology and the neuroscience of implicit bias, group identity, team performance, decision making, and public health. He lives in New York City with his family and pet hamster, Sunny. And once he taught a class while trapped in an elevator with his son and his daughter. Jay is also so much fun to talk to, and I really, really can't wait to bring this episode to you and to have him as a guest in the Culture Brain community. So here is a short snippet where Jay talks about the importance of stories in shaping culture and establishing shared norms. Leaders are effective insofar as they can tell stories. And stories are not only about where we've come from and that we have a deep history and that we're part of something, but also where we're going. And so people feel a sense of purpose and vision. And again, this is how humans evolved around the campfire telling stories. That's what resonates with us more than facts. And as you said, like early in the conversation, that's part of the key of a good book is it not just has rigorous evidence in it, but it also has stories. And the way we wrote our book, for example, is to find what the evidence was and then find a good story that became a vehicle for that piece of evidence. So other people would share it and engage with it and tell other people. If you do a good job of designing and telling stories that communicate facts, you'll, you'll remember the lessons from it. Thanks for tuning in and listening to this episode of the Culture Lab podcast. If you found any moments that were interesting, inspiring, or maybe even game-changing, please share this episode with someone who'd appreciate it. After all, good ideas are meant to be shared. If you haven't subscribed to the Culture Lab yet, you can do it on any podcast streaming platform of your choice. If you want to receive our weekly insights on cultivating a remarkable, powerful, and authentic company culture, especially in a business that scales, type this into your browser. tinyurl.com forward slash agabayer. That's 
D-I-N-Y-U-R-L dot com forward slash A-G-A B-A-J-E-R. Also, we would be ever so grateful if you could rate and review our podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to it. And finally, the entire Culture Lab team and our guests, we are going to continue exploring how we can make the word work synonymous with fun, meaning, and belonging, and how we can build remarkable cultures that scale as our businesses grow and the world keeps on changing. So, what do you want to hear about next? What matters to you? Email us at lindsay at agabayer.com and let us know. <laughs>